We are officially halfway through our study in Colossians, at least in the sense that we have finished chapter 1 and 2 and are moving on to chapter 3. This is part 13, believe it or not, in a series that I've entitled Jesus plus nothing equals everything. We're going to be looking this morning at verses 1 through 4 of Colossians chapter 3. Give careful attention to the reading of God's Word. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And may God add his rich blessing to this reading of his holy and inspired word. The whole focus of Paul's letter to the Colossians shifts here in chapter 3. In fact, when I started this series 13 sermons ago, I mentioned that this letter is neatly divided into two parts. Chapters 1 and 2 give us the vertical indicative. In other words, chapters 1 and 2 tell us what God has already done for sinners in Christ. And then chapters 3 and 4 give us the horizontal imperative or how we are to live in light of what God has done for us. Now, I think that's really, really important to understand because even the way Paul divides this letter communicates the gospel. It's amazing to me that when you think about the riches of the Bible, the Bible not only communicates the gospel with its substance, but also with its structure. That the very way the Bible is laid out tells us something about who God is and what the gospel is. And so the very neatly divided two sections of this letter communicate the gospel. Communicate first what God has done for us in Christ, chapters 1 and 2, and then second, how we are to live in light of what God has done for us in Christ, chapters 3 and 4. And the reason it's so important to understand this is because, as you've heard me say, this distinguishes the gospel from legalism. The very structure of this letter, regardless of what it says, the very structure of this letter distinguishes the gospel from legalism because legalism says, if I improve, then I'll be accepted. And that means that for legalists, Christianity is all about how I perform for God. The gospel, on the other hand, says I'm accepted because of what Jesus has done for me. I'm accepted, therefore I will inevitably improve because I am now a new creation, a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. So legalism says Christianity is all about how I perform for God. The gospel says Christianity is all about how God in Christ has performed for me. Now, not just here in Colossians, but in every other letter Paul wrote, what's fascinating to me is that he never, ever starts with what we need to do. Never. He never opens up a letter by telling us what we need to do. He always, always begins with what God has already done because he understands that to get it the other way around, to start with what we must do instead of what God has already done, will make us miss the gospel altogether. We will absolutely, completely miss the gospel altogether if we get it the other way around. Now, I think that's really important to understand because most professing Christians, and I include myself in this, most professing Christians try to live out gospel obligations 
divorced from gospel declarations, and as a result, they become legalists. Their disobedience becomes a burdensome exercise in self-improvement. Think about that for a moment. If you divorce or separate or disconnect gospel obligations from gospel declarations, if you separate the horizontal imperative from the vertical indicative, if you divorce those two ideas, then disobedience becomes a burdensome exercise in self-improvement. The bottom line is this, behavioral compliance to rules without heart change, which only the gospel can do, will be superficial and fleeting. So we're not talking here about whether to obey or not. We know the Bible has plenty to say about obeying God, keeping God's commands. That's not what we're talking about. That's indisputable. What we're talking about here is what motivates our obedience, what animates our obedience, what prompts us to obey. Is it fear or faith? Is it guilt or gratitude? And Paul says that when you divorce gospel obligations from gospel declarations, then our obedience becomes simply behavioral compliance to rules without heart change. And it's only the gospel that can change the heart and restructure the motivational posture of the heart so that our obedience now flows from faith, not fear. It flows from gratitude and not guilt. It's interesting, we looked at this last week, but, you know, Paul says in chapter 2, verse 23, that external conformation can never bring about internal transformation, ever. Outside cleanup, in other words, can never achieve inside cleanup. External law-keeping doesn't touch the source of sin. It doesn't get there. The source of sin, Paul says in chapter 2, verse 23, are the desires of the heart. And external rule-keeping can't fix that. Only the gospel can. And so when we try to clean ourselves up on the outside thinking that it will bring about some change on the inside, then we're divorcing gospel obligation from gospel declaration, and our obedience will be joyless. God says he loves a cheerful giver, which means not just any obedience is a sacrifice of praise. We're going to get into this in a few minutes, but there is a type of obedience that honors God and a type of obedience that doesn't. Pharisaical obedience does not honor God. In fact, as I mentioned last week, Jesus had some of the harshest things to say about the Pharisees. Brood of vipers, whitewashed tombs. You're clean on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. The gospel, as you've heard me say this on numerous occasions, the gospel does not first make bad people good. It makes dead people live. And if we don't understand that, then as I mentioned a moment ago, our obedience will become a burdensome exercise in self-improvement. So we're not talking about whether to obey or not to obey. We're talking about what motivates, what animates our obedience, what prompts our obedience. Because in order for our obedience to honor God, it must flow from a heart that has been changed by the gospel so that our obedience is motivated by faith and by gratitude, not by fear and guilt. Now, Paul demonstrates this very clearly by showing first what God has done for us and then explaining what our life should look like in light of what God has done for us. Now, chapter 3, verses 1 to 4 are transitional verses. In other words, these verses, this small section of four verses, bridge the gap between the two parts of the letter. And I don't want to overstate the case and say that what we find in chapter 1 and chapter 2 are exclusively gospel declarations— 
And what we find in chapter 3 and 4 are exclusively gospel obligations. We find this rhythm of indicative imperative going back and forth in all of the chapters. But what we find in chapter 1 and chapter 2 are primarily gospel declarations, though not exclusively. And what we find in chapter 3 and 4 are primarily gospel obligations, though not exclusively. So even as we get into chapter 3 and chapter 4 of this letter, we're not simply going to encounter gospel obligations or imperatives. In fact, Paul is still going to ground all of his exhortations, all of the imperatives in gospel indicatives. He's going to keep going back and showing us, now listen, and he does this to help us to keep our hearts in check. He says, now this is is what you need to do. For instance, he says in verse 5, put to death therefore what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. But notice how he begins verse 5, put to death therefore... You've heard the old adage, when you see a therefore in the Bible, you have to ask what it's there for, and it's always pointing back to the section before it. And so Paul is saying, even there, this is what I want you to do. You have to put to death what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness. You need to put that stuff to death. You need to mortify the flesh. But he motivates that obedience by saying, Do that because of what God in Christ has already done for you. In other words, you possess all of the resources you need to do verse 5 when you think about everything he has told us about Jesus in chapter 1 and chapter 2. So we get to chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, these transitional verses, and we really find a neat division here as well. In chapter... I mean, in verses 1 and 2, we find what we must do. And then in, ch- in verses 3 and 4, we find why we must do it. And so those are the two things I want to look at just briefly this morning. What we must do in verse 1 and 2, and why we must do it in verse 3 and 4. Paul, here in verses 1 and 2, gives us a very clear imperative, a command. He says, seek the things that are above. And then he says in verse 2, set your minds on things above. Very clear. He's telling us to do something. He's saying, set your mind on things above. Seek the things that are above. Well, it begs the question, okay, he's telling us to do something. He's giving a clear command. What is he talking about? What are the things above that he's referring to? If we are going to be faithful in obeying this command, if we are going to be faithful in carrying out this gospel obligation, this imperative, then it begs the question, what are the things above that he's referring to? What are the things above that I must set my mind on and the things above that I must seek? What are those things? Well, He's referring to the gospel. He's referring to all the things that Jesus has secured for sinners. He's he's referring to all the things that he's talked about in chapter 1 and 2 up until this point. Paul has told us some remarkable things about Jesus and about what he has accomplished for sinners We've looked at that in chapter 1. We looked at that in chapter 2. He's told us some amazing things about the gospel. He has, in reality, preached the gospel in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And so when he begins chapter 3 by saying, set your mind on things above, seek the things that are above, he's saying, preach the gospel to yourself every day. That's Paul saying, preach the gospel to yourself every day. Now, you've heard me say that before, whether you've been a Christian for 50 years or for five minutes, since we never leave off sin, we can never leave off the gospel, which has only always been the antidote to sin. So 
The gospel doesn't just ignite the Christian life. It's the fuel that keeps Christians going and growing every day. The finished work of Jesus on behalf of sinners is intended by God to motivate us, to animate us, to change us, to transform us from the inside out as we make our way across the wilderness of this life toward the promised land. So, as I've said before, the same gospel that gets you into the kingdom advances the kingdom in you. It's very, very important for us to understand that. And Paul himself reiterates that by saying in verse 1 and verse 2, set your mind on things above, seek the things that are above. In other words, go back every day and remember and recall and revel in all of the things that Jesus has accomplished for you. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. Say, okay, I understand that. Paul is saying, preach the gospel to yourself every day. Set your mind on the gospel. Seek the gospel. But it begs the question, if we're supposed to preach the gospel to ourselves every day, what is the content of the gospel? I mean, I understand the need to preach it, but in order for me to preach it effectively to myself, I need to understand something of its content. Well, go back with me to Colossians chapter 1. We looked at these verses 9 through 14 for two weeks, a number of weeks ago. Paul writes in chapter 1, verse 9, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. What he's describing there is the Christian life. He's saying to the Colossians, this is what I pray for you. I pray that you would grow in your knowledge of God, that you would grow in your joy, that you would grow in your knowledge of God's will, that you would become more mature, that you would become more like Jesus. But notice what he says in verse 12. Notice what he grounds this Christian behavior in. He says, giving thanks to the Father who has, past tense, already qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has, past tense, already delivered us from the domain of darkness and, past tense, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we already have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In other words, what Paul is saying, he's giving us the content of the gospel. What's the content of the gospel? The, go the content of the gospel is simply this. If you have transferred trust from your accomplishments and your abilities to Christ's accomplishment on behalf of sinners, if God has saved you, if he's given you the faith to believe and you are now a Christian, then the content of the gospel is this. You have already been qualified. You have already been delivered. You have already been transferred. You've already been redeemed. You've already been forgiven. And what he says is that what we must do practically can only be done as we come to a deeper understanding of what we are positionally. In other words, what we must do on a practical day-to-day -day basis can only be done as we come to a deeper understanding of what is already ours in Christ. Remember, I said a number of weeks ago that I used to think that in order to grow as a Christian, I had to go out and get stuff that I did not already have. So if, I, if I'm going to grow as a Christian, if I'm going to mature, I need to go out and get more joy. I need to go out and get more patience. I need to go out and get more faithfulness. That if I'm going to grow as a Christian, I need to go out and get this stuff. But that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the gospel is. We don't grow 
This was paradigm shattering for me, by the way, and it changed the entire way I read the Bible. We don't grow by going out and getting what we don't have. We grow as we come to a greater understanding of what we already do have. That Jesus has already secured all of the resources we need in order to grow and to press on and strain forward, which is why the Puritans were fond of saying that far too often Christians live beneath the level of their privileges. We have eternal resources at our disposal, so we don't have to go out and get what we don't have. The hard work of Christian growth is to increasingly live in light of what we already do have. Or you could put it this way. The hard work of sanctification is a continuous going back to your justification. Now you say, okay, what does that mean? You know in Philippians when Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It begs the question, what is the work that he's talking about? What is the work that he is exhorting us to do? And he goes on to say, well, the hard work, working out your salvation with fear and trembling, is coming to a greater understanding of the work that God has already done in you. Because it is only as God works in you will you be able to will and to work according to his good pleasure. In other words, it's only as you come to a greater understanding of the gospel in you will your obedience be done in a manner that honors God and pleases God. So the hard work of sanctification is a continuous going back to your justification, going back and saying, what does it mean for me here and now that I have been justified? Now, if you don't know what that word means, if you have no clue what justification means. Let me just explain it to you briefly. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 says, for he has made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to become sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, commenting on that verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Jerry Bridges writes this. Picture a moral ledger sheet with every word, thought, deed, and motive of yours entered on that sheet. Okay, that should make you feel uncomfortable. Most people hope that the good will outweigh the bad. The problem is that because of sin, all of our deeds are stained. All of our works are unclean and impure. There is no such thing as a positive ledger sheet, except in the case of Christ. His ledger sheet was perfect. So at the cross, our ledger sheet was charged to Christ, and his ledger sheet is credited to us. To be justified is not simply just as if I'd never sinned. That is a great truth, but it's actually much more than that. To be justified is to be just as if I'd always obeyed. Now, this is what that means. God has credited the very righteousness of Jesus to every Christian so that if you are in Christ, the verdict is in, pardoned forever. That's what justification means. It means that Jesus lived the life we couldn't live. He died the death we should have died. And on the cross, he accomplished a glorious exchange where his perfect ledger sheet was credited to us and our sin-stained ledger sheet was imputed to him. A double imputation. That's what it means to be justified. It means that you are eternally in. Listen carefully, okay, because this is something that you and I need to preach to ourselves every day, every day, because as I've said, 
week after week after week, we're all looking for acceptance. We're all looking for approval. We're all looking for a verdict. And we're looking for acceptance and we're looking for approval in various places with various people. And so the question is not, are you seeking approval? Are you seeking acceptance? It's, where are you seeking for your approval? Where are you seeking for your acceptance? Listen, to be justified means that God's acceptance of us cannot be gained by our successes nor forfeited by our failures. Okay, I'm going to say that again. And this time someone will say amen. Someone down here, I'm sure. (laughs) To be justified means that God's acceptance of us cannot be gained by our successes nor forfeited by our failures. (laughs) Good. There are a few Baptists among us. (laughs) To be justified, this one's even a little bit more shocking. To be justified means that our standing with God does not depend on our obedience. Okay? To be justified means that our standing with God is dependent on Christ's obedience for us. Think about that for a moment because most of us drift into performance mode when it comes to our relationship with God. Okay? Most of us think that at some level our standing with God is dependent on our performance, on our obedience, and that our disobedience can forfeit our standing with God. To be justified means that our standing with God does not depend on our obedience. It's dependent on Christ's obedience for us. And what Paul is saying is, set your minds on that. Preach that to yourself every day so that you don't find yourself drifting into performance mode when it comes to your relationship to God, so that you don't find yourself looking to something smaller than Jesus for your acceptance and your approval. In other words, what the gospel does is it liberates you to obey God in a way that brings him praise and honor. That's what it does. It doesn't just free you from sin and slavery. It frees you to become all that God originally intended for you to become. So what he's saying in verse 1 and 2 is, Preach the gospel to yourself every day. Every single day, preach this to yourself. God's acceptance of me cannot be gained by my successes or forfeited by my failures, that my standing with God does not depend on my obedience. It's dependent on Christ's obedience for me, which is a done deal. It is finished. Eternally in, forever pardoned. That's the gospel. But you got to preach that to yourself every day because, you know, our hearts are prone to wander. Our hearts are filled with pride, and so we so easily drift into performance mode. But then he goes on in verse 3 and 4 and basically says, this is why we must do verse 1 and 2. Notice, he doesn't say, Do verses 1 and 2 or else God will be angry with you. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, set your mind on things above or else God will get you. He doesn't say that. You can't find that in verse 3 and 4. It's not there. He says, do this, do verses 1 and 2 because that's who you are now. It makes no sense to go back to the old ways. You've been made new. The old is gone. The new has come. You're a new creation in Christ. Notice what he says. Verse 3, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. He says, For you died, past tense, And your life is now, present tense, hidden with Christ in God. 
When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear, future tense, with him in glory. In other words, be who you are. Be assured of who you've been remade to be. He's saying, become practically what you already are positionally. That's what he's saying. You can work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You can do verses 1 and 2 because verses 3 and 4 tell us because God has already worked in you. He has made you new. He's raised you from death to life. It's a done deal. I was thinking a lot this week about Psalm 32, 7. You can either go there or write it down and go there later, but I was meditating on this verse last Sunday afternoon and also last Monday. And it's a relatively well-known verse. David says in Psalm 32, verse 7, You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with Shouts of deliverance. And I, I asked myself the painful and probing question, do I find my protection and my security, my hiding place in Jesus or in something or someone else? Can I really say he is my hiding place? He is the one who provides me with all of the protection and all of the security that I need and crave. And this is what I thought about two famous mountains in the Bible. Mount Sinai, where God gave the law to Moses, and Mount Calvary, where Jesus died on the cross for sinners like me. Mount Sinai says, you must do. That's the message that thunders from Mount Sinai. Mount Calvary says, because you couldn't, Jesus did. Now, what's the connection between Psalm 32, 7 and the two mountains? It's this. Don't run to the wrong mountain for your hiding place. You see, you're either running for shelter and safety in your own performance or in the performance of Christ for you. We are all running for shelter and safety and protection somewhere. Whether you've ever put it in those terms or not, you're running to one of two mountains. And the Mount, Mount Sinai says you must do and you're either running for shelter and safety in your own performance or you're running to Mount Calvary, which shouts Christ's performance for you because you could not perform for God due to sin. God in Christ has performed for you. Let me just talk for a few minutes about the law, Old Testament law specifically. And we're going to get a little technical here, so you're going to have to follow me carefully, okay? And then it'll get real practical here in a few moments, because I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm saying. I certainly don't want anyone to misunderstand what the Bible is saying, okay? Because it would be very, very easy for us to read these verses, to read chapter 2, verses 16 to 23, and say, basically, Paul is anti-God's law. He's not, okay? He, he's not anti-God's law. He's not pitting law against gospel. That's not what he's doing here. In fact, what we find in Colossians 3 and 4 and a lot of other places are commandments to obey, to obey what God has told us to do. So that's not what's going on here. Paul is getting to the deeper issue of what motivates our obedience to the law. It's not just enough to obey. Because God loves a cheerful giver, he cares about what motivates our obedience, what animates our obedience. So let me just talk for a few minutes about the law. Old Testament law is divided into three parts, okay? Just follow me here. Civil laws, 
ceremonial laws and the moral law. If you read those sections of the Old Testament that speak specifically about the laws that God gave to Israel, it's divided into three sections, civil laws, ceremonial laws, and the moral law. Now, I don't have time to get into this in much detail, but basically the civil and ceremonial laws of the Old Testament don't apply to us today. Jesus fulfilled those on our behalf. The moral law, however, does still apply to us today. You say, well, what's the moral law? The moral law is the the Ten Commandments, summarized by Jesus in the greatest commandment. And theologians have rightly pointed out that when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, he is summarizing the Ten Commandments because the first four commandments talk about how we honor God, how we love God, and the last six commandments tell us how to love one another. So when he says, Jesus says, you want me to summarize the law? It's love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, commandments one through four, and love your neighbor as yourself, commandments four through, or five through 10, right? Yeah, five through 10. So the moral law still applies. Now, theologians have identified three uses of the moral law. Okay, just follow me here. Okay, so you got Old Testament law divided into three parts, civil, ceremonial, moral. You take the moral law, Ten Commandments, what Jesus described as loving God and loving others. You take the moral law, and that further divides into three parts, okay? This is going to get really heavy. The pedagogical use of the law, okay, theologians have identified three uses of the moral law. The pedagogical use, the political use, and the practical use. Now, I'm going to explain what this means, okay? Don't drift off and start thinking about lunch yet. All right, listen. The pedagogical use of the law simply means that the law exposes our guilt and drives us to Jesus. In other words, the law teaches us. That's why they call it the pedagogical use. The law teaches us that Jesus has come to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. We examine our lives in light of God's law, and we realize we can't save ourselves, and so we run to Jesus. In other words, Mount Sinai sends us to Mount Calvary. Okay, that's the pedagogical use of the law. The political use of the law means that to the degree we apply God's moral law in society, sin is kept at bay, really. Okay. In other words, to the degree that we, you know, take the Ten Commandments seriously and apply that in society, in culture, then sin doesn't run roughshod all over the place. The practical use is what John Calvin called the primary use. The practical use of the moral law is basically intended to show Christians what pleases God. Okay, so we look at the Ten Commandments, and there we get a picture of the kind of life we should live in order to please God. We get a picture. It's a guide. It's a helper. It shows us what kind of lifestyle pleases the Lord. So the law is not bad, Gospel declarations must never be severed from gospel obligations, okay? Hear me say that. Now, but, this is key, so key as it concerns our thinking about the law, even the practical use of the moral law can become a substitute savior, okay? That's that's what Paul is primarily interested in here. He's, He's primarily interested in the heart As I said last week, legalism is attractive because it promises safety and control if we can create a set of achievable standards and obeyable rules. We want to manufacture a controllable black and white world, a world where there is no unpredictability because we are afraid and we think that rules and regulations and strict adherence and observation of rules and regulations will protect us. So you see what happens here. Instead of depending on Jesus for our protection and security, we depend on our ability to establish and keep rules for our protection and security. Now, listen, I'm an expert on this stuff. And I'll tell you why. Because I'm a legalist. That's why. And I think it would be wise for all of you to admit that you are too. Because, as the Bible makes very clear, legalism is the heart's natural default mode. Legalism is trying to secure our own standing, our own righteousness, 
So when you go back to the Garden of Eden, what you discover is Adam and Eve trying to secure their own righteousness, trying to secure their own standing, trying to be their own God. That's legalism. The gospel is that God in Christ supplies an alien righteousness, an outside righteousness that we could never achieve or attain on our own. It comes from God. So I, I, I tend to be legalistic, okay? But this is the interesting thing. If I were really honest and I've had to probe my heart deeply because I want the gospel down deep, real deep, not just on the surface. I want it, I mean, I want it part of the warp and woof of my being, to use an old English phrase, okay? I, I, I keep the moral law or, or I, I, my legalism, okay, is this. I, I do it. I do my legalism under the guise of keeping the moral law when in reality I'm using the moral law, my observation of the moral law, to justify my legalism. That's what I do. I'm just, I'm just observing God's law. Don't call me a legalist. I'm just observing the law of God and conforming my life accordingly. That's all I'm doing. Okay? Well, no, that's not all I'm doing. And that's not all you're doing either. <laughs> if we were really honest, we would say that we use, and the practical use of the moral law is important. It's what demonstrates a life that pleases the Lord. But what we do is we justify our legalism under the guise of keeping the moral law. Listen, there is one primary enemy of the gospel, legalism. But... Legalism comes in two forms, okay? Some people try to save themselves by keeping the rules. Others try to save themselves by breaking the rules. In other words, there are two rules, two legalisms that we can live by other than Christ. The rule which says, I can find freedom and fullness if I can keep the law and impose the law on others, or the rule which says I can find freedom and fullness if I break the law. In other words, there are two ways to run from God, not one. There are two ways to try and save yourself, not one. There is break the rules legalism and keep the rules legalism. And the pressing point is this, that if most people outside the church are guilty of break the rules legalism, most people inside the church are guilty of keep the rules legalism. Now, this is scary stuff, and I'll tell you why. Because it's, it's understandable if you say, no, wait a minute, whoa, hold on. If God accepts me unconditionally so that whether I succeed or fail, my acceptance with God is not in jeopardy, then what incentive do I have for being good? It's a natural question, okay? I mean, if, if God accepts me unconditionally so that whether I succeed or fail, whether I obey or disobey, my acceptance with God is not in jeopardy, then what incentive do I have for being good? What motivates me to be good if my standing with God is forever secure? Well, begs this question, what was your incentive before? Think about it. For a minute. Paul never uses the law as a way to motivate obedience. Ever. He always, always, always uses the gospel. Look quickly at 2 Corinthians. Let me just give you a quick example of this. There are examples all over the Bible. But let me just give you a quick example. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul is writing here to the Corinthian church, encouraging them to give generously, to give financially to the work of God's expanding kingdom. And he says in verse 8, we looked at this a number of weeks ago, he says in verse 8, I say this not as a command. In other words, he's saying, give generously. Give generously to the work of God. Give sacrificially. And then he says in verse 8, 
This is where it gets to how he motivates them to give. He says, I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. Okay? So he doesn't say, give generously, because if you don't, God is just waiting to smack you. That's not what he uses. He doesn't use fear. And he doesn't use guilt. He doesn't say, you know, you guys have way more money than you need. And you've got all these people over there that don't have enough. You're so unbelievably selfish. Give. I mean, that's the way we parent. That's not the way God parents. Paul doesn't say that. In fact, he goes out of his way to say, I don't say this to you as a command. Because Paul understands that God loves a cheerful giver. And so Paul is not just concerned with obedience, but gospel-motivated obedience. And so he says in verse 9, as a way to motivate them to give, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Why should you give? Because God in Christ is given to you. And when you focus on that gospel declaration, it makes you generous. When you focus on Christ's generosity to you, it motivates generous obedience. Only the gospel can do that. Paul never uses the law as a way to motivate obedience. He always uses the gospel. So because God loves a cheerful giver, you cannot please God when you obey out of fear. That's what the law does. The only obedience that pleases God is obedience that flows from faith. Faith in what God has already done. Faith that God loves you in Christ whether you are obedient or not. Faith in the fact that you will only get better when you understand that your relationship with God does not depend on you getting better. I mean, let me say that again. Faith. When you obey God out of faith, well, faith in what? Faith in what God has already done. Faith in the fact that you will only get better when you understand that your relationship with God does not depend on you getting better. I said a number of weeks ago, the irony of the gospel is this, that when I focus less on my performance for God, and more on God's performance for me in Christ, I actually perform better in life. <laughs> because it motivates down deep performance. Gospel performance. It's not just an obligation, it's a gospel obligation that is fueled and animated and motivated by a gospel declaration. Big difference. Huge difference. So if you find yourself saying, no, wait a second, all of my incentive for being good goes away if you tell me that whether I succeed or fail, my acceptance with God is not in jeopardy. I know we say that stuff, and the question is, the deep question is, well, what was your incentive for being good? Fear? Guilt? You know, we don't want to talk about freedom too much. We don't want to talk too much about grace. We got we to gotta give some law to keep this place in order. I don't want to talk to my kids too much about grace because if I talk too much about the fact that whether they obey or disobey, if they're in Christ, they are forever accepted, they're not going to obey. They'll take it and run with it. I have to trust the Lord with that. I mean, this is why churches across the country are so, they're not preaching the gospel because they're not preaching God's free, outrageous, outlandish grace. Outlandish. His grace is scary. It's scary because 
It takes the wind out of our performance sails, and we've become so accustomed to finding security and protection in what I can control and, what I, and how I can perform. You take that away, and we start thinking, well, it's all going to hell in a handbasket now. The gospel is radical. The freedom of the gospel is scandalous. Justification is profound. Profound. Kim and I, let me just conclude with this. Kim and I were in San Diego all week, and I had to speak at a conference, but we also had the opportunity to be with some friends. And on one of the days, Kim and I spent the day with a friend of ours named Elise Fitzpatrick, who's written a number of books. I've quoted her before from the pulpit. She wrote a remarkable book called Because He Loves Me that I recommend highly for all of you to read as far as how to understand the gospel. But she also just finished a book on parenting. It won't come out uh, until the fall or winter. She honored me by asking me to write the foreword to the book. But uh, Elise writes this book on parenting. She's a grandmother now, but she writes this book on, on parenting, thinking back to the mistakes she made as a parent and asking the question, what does it really look like to parent children in the gospel? And she tells this story, she told Kim and I this story about her daughter, who is a Christian, who she wrote the book with, and her daughter's son, one of her daughter's son, daughter's oldest son. And she said, her daughter will say to her oldest son, "Uh, you need to share your transformer with your brother. And uh, then she goes on to say, if the son says, why? Say, because I want you to think about this, that in the person of Jesus, God shared his best with you. And so in doing that, she's trying to motivate obedience with the gospel. She doesn't say, share your transformer with your brother, and if you don't, I'm going to whip you. Okay, she doesn't say that. She says, share your transformer with your brother, And the reason I want you to share your transformer with your brother is because God in Jesus has shared his best with you. And she says, most parents go that far. Some don't. But most parents, if they care about trying to get the gospel into their children, go at least that far. But she says, I still don't think that's far enough. She says, my daughter goes on to say, share your transformer with your brother And the reason you should share your transformer with your brother is because God in Christ shared his best with you. But hear me, even if you decide not to share your transformer with your brother, that will not impact your standing before God. Now that is scary. And it's what Elise rightly calls free falling into grace. It removes the controls. It removes the controls. It takes fear out of the equation. And it replaces it with faith. Now, you may not get immediate results of that kind of parenting, but I can promise you this, you won't raise moralists if you do that. You won't raise legalists if you do that. You will raise... Boys and girls who understand the radical nature of the gospel. Listen, if you've never asked the Romans 6-1 question, you know the Romans 6-1 question, okay? Paul speaks about the outlandish nature of God's grace and the gospel in Romans chapter 5, and then he begins chapter 6 by saying, he anticipates this question. He anticipates, well, in light of what you just said, should we sin more now that gra- so that grace may abound? If you've, if you've never asked the Romans 6-1 question, it makes sense to ask that question in light of God's outlandish grace. Well, I'll just sin more. It's a great deal. God gives me grace. I can sin. I'm still accepted. Hallelujah. Okay? So it's understandable. You've never wrestled, if you've never asked the Romans 6 question, you've never wrestled with God's outrageous mercy, you've never tasted the radical nature of God's amazing grace. When you begin to understand the shocking nature of God's unconditional grace, you ask, should we sin more so that grace may abound? It's natural. You're asking it right now, probably. I've been asking it all week. 
course, Paul's answer is, of course not. No, you don't get the gospel if you separate declaration from obligation. Of course, you shouldn't sin more that grace may abound. But the very fact that he anticipates the question tells us that God's grace painfully wrestles us out of performance mode. Painfully. If this is uncomfortable for you, good, should be, should be. No matter who you are, I don't care who you are, you are living life, you are either living life in search of acceptance or you're living life in light of your acceptance. That's it. Real slavery is living your life trying to gain approval. Real freedom is living your life because you're already approved. So my question, closing question to you this morning is, where do you run? Because you're either running to your own performance or you're running to the performance of Jesus. You're either running to Sinai or Calvary. Where do you run? Where do you run for shelter? Where do you run for your hiding place? Where do you run for protection and security and meaning and purpose, grounding? Where do you run? You're either running... You're either running to yourself or you're running to Jesus. And let me just say this, rather than defining ourselves by what we must do and what we can accomplish, that's the epitome of slavery, we can be defined by what Christ has done and what he's already accomplished. That's freedom.